The Witch of Blackbird Pond, Chapter 19 The sun had been slanting through the chinks in the shed wall for hours when Kit heard the heavy bolt withdrawn and the shed door opened. This time it was the constable's wife, with a wooden trencher of mush. In spite of its dubious appearance, it sent a faint curl of steam into the frosty air, and Kit forced herself to take a few spoonfuls while the woman stood watching, hands on her hips. "'I reckon you'd be half froze,' the woman observed. "'To tell the truth, I couldn't sleep half the night thinking of you out here. "'Tis good enough for thieves and drunkards,' I says to my man. "'But tis no place for a female, witch or no. "'I've seen the girl in meeting,' I says, "'sitting there decent as you please. "'And it goes against reason she could be a witch.' There's some folks in this town always bent on stirring up trouble. Kit looked up at her gratefully. "'Twas good of you to send the quilt, she said. How long will they keep me here, do you think? My man has orders to take you to that town house in an hour. So soon. Kit put down the spoon, her stomach curling. What will happen there? The magistrate and the ministers will examine you. If they think you be guilty, they'll send you on to Hartford to wait trial. At any rate, you'll be off our hands. My man and I, we don't relish this work much. We'll be glad when his term is up. Kit laid down the trencher in dismay. But I can't go like this. I've been sitting in the dirt all night. The face she lifted to the woman was even sorrier than she realized, streaked with mud and tears. "'You're no treat to look at, that's sure,' the woman admitted. "'If they took you for a witch right now, I'd scarce blame them. Wait a minute.' She went away, taking the precaution of bolting the door securely, and returned presently with a basin of water and a rough wooden comb. Gratefully, Kit did what she could to make herself respectable. The dress, dirty and crumpled, could not be helped. It required the constable and two sturdy members of the watch to conduct a timid witch up Carpenter's Lane, along Broad Street, up Hungry Hill to the town house. The small building seemed full of people as she entered. Benches and chairs along the two walls were crowded with men from the town, with here and there a sharp-faced woman, cronies of Goodwife Cruff. At a table at the end of the room sat Captain Samuel Talcott, magistrate from Wethersfield to the General Court of Connecticut, and a group of men whom Kit knew as the town selectmen. Her uncle sat in his place among them, his lips tight, his eyebrows drawn fiercely together. What anguish it must cost him, Kit thought with shame, to have to sit here and pass judgment on a member of his own household. At the opposite end of the table sat the two ministers, Reverend John Woodbridge and Dr. Gershom Bulkley, both famed for their relentless sermons against witchcraft. Kit's heart sank. There was no one, no one in the whole room, save her uncle, who would speak a word in her defense. William had not come. Captain Talcott rapped on the table, and a hush fell over the room. "'Good folk, we will proceed at once to the business at hand. "'We have come here in order to inquire and search "'into the matter of Mistress Catherine Tyler, lately of Barbados, "'who is accused by sundry witnesses of the practice of witchcraft. "'Mistress Tyler will come forward.' Prompted by the constable's elbow, Kit got to her feet and moved haltingly across the room to stand facing the magistrate across the table. "'You will listen to the charge against you,' a clerk read from a parchment, giving full weight and due to every awful word. "'Catherine Tyler, thou art here accused.' that not having the fear of God before thine eyes, thou hast had familiarity with Satan, 
the grand enemy of God and man, and that by his instigation and help thou hast in a preternatural way afflicted and done harm to the bodies and estates of sundry of his majesty's subjects in the third year of his majesty's reign for which by the law of god and the law of the colony thou deservest to die there was a murmur along the benches kit's hands felt icy but she kept her eyes steadily on the magistrate mrs tyler you are accused by adam croft with the following actions Firstly, that you were the familiar friend and companion of the widow Hannah Tupper of Blackbird Pond, an alleged witch who has within the past week disappeared in a suspicious manner. Such friendship is a lawful test of guilt, inasmuch as it is well known that witchcraft is an art that may be learned and conveyed from one person to another and that it has often fallen out that a witch, upon dying, leaveth some heir to her witchcraft. Secondly, that you are guilty of actions and works which infer a court with the devil, which have caused illness and death to fall upon many innocent children in this town. The clerk sat down. Captain Talcott eyed the girl before him. Quite plainly, he had a distaste for the duty at hand, but his stern, soldierly countenance did not soften. Mistress Tyler, he said, you have heard the complaints against you. We will proceed with the first accusation. Is it true that you were a friend and companion of the widow Tupper. For a moment, Kit feared that her voice would not come. Yes, sir, she managed, shakily. Is it true that on sundry occasions, during the summer, you have entered her house and visited with her? Yes, sir. Is it true that you were also acquainted with a certain cat, which the widow entertained as a familiar spirit. It, it was just an ordinary cat, sir, like any cat. You will answer yes or no. Is it true that you have engaged with the widow Tupper in various enchantments with the direct intent of causing mischief to certain people? Oh, no, sir. I don't know what you mean by enchantments. Do you deny that on a certain day in August last, on passing the pasture of Goodman Whittlesley, you cast a spell upon his cattle so that they were rooted to the ground where they stood and refused to answer his call or to give any milk on that evening? I, I don't understand, sir. How could I do such a thing? Goodman Whittlesley, will you repeat your complaint for this assembly? Her head reeling, Kit stood helpless as, one after the other, they rose and made their complaints, these men and women whom she scarcely recognized. The evidence rolled against her like a dark wave. One man's child had cried aloud all night that someone was sticking pins into him. Another child had seen a dark creature with horns at the foot of her bed. A woman who lived along South Road testified that one morning Kit had stopped and spoken to her child, and that within ten minutes the child had fallen into a fit and lain ill for five days. Another woman testified that one afternoon last September she had been sitting in the window sewing a jacket for her husband, when she had looked up and seen Kit walking past her house, staring up at the window in a strange manner. Whereupon, try as she would, 
the sleeve would never set right in the jacket. A man swore he had seen Kit and Goody Tupper dance round a fire in the meadow one moonlit night, and that a great black man taller than an Indian had suddenly appeared from nowhere and joined in the dance. Matthew Wood leapt suddenly to his feet. "'I protest this mockery!' he roared, in a voice that silenced every whisper. "'Not one word of this nonsense could be proved in the court of assistance. "'There is not one shred of lawful evidence in the lot. "'I beg you, Sam Talcott, make an end of it. "'Do I infer that you are willing to vouch for your niece's good character, Matthew Wood?' "'Certainly I will vouch for it.' "'We are to understand, then, that these visits to the widow Tupper were taken with your approval?' Taken aback, Matthew glared at the magistrate. "'No, I had no knowledge of them,' he admitted. "'Did you ever, at any time, indicate to your niece that she was not to associate with this woman?' "'Yes, I forbade her to go.' "'Then the girl has been disobedient and deceitful.' "'Matthew clenched his fists in frustration. "'The girl has been thoughtless and headstrong at times, "'but her upbringing has been such as to encourage that. "'You admit, then, that her education has been irregular. "'You can twist what I say as you will, Sam Talcott.' said Matthew in steely anger. But I swear before all present, on my word as a freeman of the colony, that the girl is no witch. We are obliged to listen to the testimony, Matthew, said Captain Talcott. I will thank you to keep silent. What is your opinion of the case, Dr. Bulkley? Dr. Bulkley cleared his throat. "'In my opinion,' he said deliberately, "'it is necessary to use the greatest caution "'in the matter of testimony. "'Since the unnatural events so far recounted "'appear to rest in each case, Upon the word of but one witness, the legality of any one of them is open to question. It is ridiculous to talk of legality, interrupted Matthew. There has not one word been spoken that makes sense. For the last few moments, Goodwife Cruff had been vehemently prodding her husband he rose now obediently. Sir, I've summit to say as makes sense, he announced, assuming a bold tone, and there's more than one witness to prove it. I've got summit here as was found in the widow's house that night. With a sinking heart, Kit watched as he drew an object from his pocket. It was not the horn book as she expected. It was the little copy book. At sight of it, Goodwife Cruff's anger burst through all restraints. Look at that, she demanded. What do you say about that? My Prudence's name written over and over. Tis a spell, that's what it is. A mercy the child is alive today. Another hour and she'd have been dying like the others. The magistrate accepted the copy book reluctantly as though it were tainted. Do you recognize this book, Mistress Tyler? Kit could barely stand upright. She tried to answer, but only a hoarse whisper came out. Speak up, girl, he ordered sharply. Does this book belong to you? Yes, sir, she managed. Did you write this name? Kit could barely swallow. She had vowed she would never deceive her uncle again. Then, remembering, she looked back at the copybook. Yes, the name on the first line was in her own hand, 
large and clear for Prudence to copy. Yes, sir, she said, her voice loud with relief. I wrote the name. Matthew Wood passed a hand over his eyes. He looked old, old and ill as he had looked that day beside Mercy's bed. Why should you write a child's name over and over like that? I, I can't tell you, sir. Captain Talcott looked perplexed. There are no other children's names here, he said. Why did you choose to write the name of Prudence Cruff? Kit was silent. Mistress Tyler, the magistrate spoke to her directly. I had considered this morning's inquiry merely a formality. I did not expect to find any evidence worthy of carrying to the court. But this is a serious matter. You must explain to us how this child's name came to be written. As Kit looked back at him mutely, the restraints that held the tensely waiting crowd gave way. Men and women leapt to their feet, screaming, She won't answer! That proves she's guilty! She's a witch! She's as good as admitted it! We don't need a jury trial. Put her to the water test. Hanging's too good for her. In the midst of the pandemonium, Gershom Bulkley quietly reached for the copybook, studied it carefully, and turned a shrewd, deliberative eye upon Kit. Then he whispered something to the magistrate. Captain Talcott nodded. Silence! he barked. This is the colony of Connecticut. Every man and woman is entitled to a trial before a jury. This case will be turned over to the general session in Hartford. The inquiry is dismissed. Hold on a minute, Captain, called a voice. A commotion near the door had been scarcely noticed. There's a fellow here says he has an important witness for the case. Every voice was suddenly stilled. Almost paralyzed with dread, Kit turned slowly to face a new accuser. On the threshold of the room stood Nat Eaton, slim, straight-shouldered, without a trace of mockery in his level blue eyes. Nat! The wave of joy and relief was so unexpected that she almost lost her balance, but almost instantly it drained away and left a new fear, for she saw that beside him, clinging tightly to his hand, was Prudence Cruff. Goodwife Cruff let out a piercing scream. Take her out of here! The witch will put an evil eye on her! She and her husband both started forward. Stand back! ordered the magistrate. The child is protected here. Where is the witness? Nat put his hands on the child's shoulders and gently urged her forward. With one trusting look up at his face, Prudence walked steadily toward the magistrate's table. Suddenly, Kit found her voice. Oh, please, sir, she cried, the tears running down her face. Let them take her away. It's all my fault. I would do anything to undo it if I could. I never meant any harm, but I'm responsible for all of it. Please, take me to Hartford. Do what you want with me, but, oh, I beg you, send Prudence away from this horrible place. The magistrate waited till this outburst was over. "'Tis a trifle late to think about the child,' he said coldly. "'Come here, child.' Kit sank on her knees and buried her face in her hands. The buzz in the room roared like a swarm of bees around her head. Then there was a waiting hush. She could scarcely bear to look at Prudence, but she forced herself to raise her head. The child was barefoot and her snarled hair was uncovered. Her thin arms under the skimpy jumper were blue with cold. Then Kit stared again. There was something strange about Prudence. 
Will you stand there, child, in front of the table? Captain St Talcott spoke reassuringly. Watching Prudence, Kit suddenly felt a queer prickling along her spine. There was something different about her. The child's head was up. Her eyes were fastened levelly on the magistrate. Prudence was not afraid. "'We will ask you some questions, Prudence,' said the magistrate quietly. "'You will answer them as truthfully as you possibly can. Do you understand?' "'Yes, sir,' whispered Prudence. "'Do you know this young woman?' "'Oh, yes, sir, she's my teacher. She taught me to read.' "'You mean at the dame school?' "'No, I never went to the dame school.' "'Then where did she teach you?' "'At Hannah's house in the meadow.' A loud scream from Goodwife Cruff tore across the room. "'You mean Mistress Tyler took you to Hannah Tupper's house?' "'The first time she took me there. After that I went by myself.' "'The little weasel!' cried Goodwife Cruff. "'That's where she was all those days.' I'll see that girl hung. It is all over, thought Kit, with a wave of faintness. Gershom Bulkley still held the little copy book. He spoke now under his breath and passed the book to Captain Talcott. Have you seen this book before? The magistrate questioned. Oh, yes, sir. Kit gave it to me. I wrote my name in it. That's a lie! cried Goodwife Cruff. The child is bewitched! Captain Talcott turned to Kit. Is it true, he asked her, that the child wrote her own name in this book? Kit dragged herself to her feet. Tis true, she answered dully. I wrote it for her once, and then she copied it. You can't take her word for anything, sir, protested Goodman Cruff timidly. The child don't know what she's saying. I might as well tell it. Prudence has never been what you'd call bright. She never could learn much. The magistrate paid no attention. Could you write your name again, do you think? I, I think so, sir. He dipped the quill pen carefully in the ink and handed it to the child. Leaning over the table... Prudence set the pen on the copy book. For a moment there was not a single sound in the room but the hesitant scratching. Goodman Cruff was on his feet. Propelled by a curiosity greater than any awe for the magistrate, he came slowly across the room and peered over his child's shoulder. Is that proper writing? he demanded in unbelief. Prudence Cruff? Does it say right out as it should? The magistrate glanced at the writing and handed the copy book to Gershom Bulkley. Very proper writing, I should say, Dr. Bulkley commented, for a child with no learning. The magistrate leaned to take the pen out of the small fingers. Goodman Cruff tiptoed back to the bench. The bluster was gone from him. He looked dazed. Now, Prudence, the magistrate continued, you say that Mistress Tyler taught you to read? What sort of reading? Goodwife Cruff rose in a frenzy. Magic signs and spells, I tell you. The child would never know the difference. Gershom Bulkley also rose to his feet. That, at least, will be easy to prove, he suggested reasonably. What can you read, child? I can read the Bible. Dr. Bulkley picked up the great Bible from the table and turned the pages thoughtfully. Then, moving to hand the book to Prudence, he realized that it was too heavy for her to hold and laid it carefully on the table beside her. Read that for us, child, beginning right there. Kit held her breath. Was it the tick of the great clock that sounded so frightening 
or her own heart. Then across the silence came a whisper. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wis wisdom and in in instruction and understanding. The childish voice slowly gained strength and clarity till it reached every corner of the room. The father of the right righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wish child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. In the warm rush of pride that welled up in her, Kit forgot her fear. For the first time she dared to look back at Nat Eaton, where he stood near the door. Across the room their eyes met, and suddenly it was as though he had thrown a line straight into her reaching hands. She could feel the pull of it, and over its taut span strength flowed into her, warm and sustaining. When finally she looked away, she realized that everyone in the room was staring at the two parents. They had both leaned forward, their mouths open in shock and unbelief. As she listened, Goodwife Cruff's face darkened and her eyes narrowed. She saw now that she had been tricked. The fresh anger that was gathering would be vented on her child. On the father's face a new emotion seemed to be struggling. As the thin voice ended, Goodwife Cruff drew in her breath through her teeth in a venomous hiss. But before she could release it, her husband sprang forward. "'Did you hear that?' he demanded widely of everyone present. All at once his shoulders straightened. "'That was real good reading. I'd like to see any boy in this town do better.' "'It's a trick!' denied his wife. "'That child can never read a word in her life. She's bewitched, I tell you.' "'Hold your tongue, woman!' shouted her husband unexpectedly. I'm sick and tired of hearing about Prudence being bewitched. All these years you've been telling me our child was half-witted. Why, well, she's smart as a whip. I bet it weren't much of a trick to teach her to read. Goodwife Cruff's jaw dropped. For one moment she was struck utterly dumb, and in that moment her husband stepped into his rightful place. There was a new authority in his voice. All my life I've wished I could read. If I'd had a son, I'd have seen to it he learned his letters. Well, this is a new country over here, and who says it might not be just as needful for a woman to read as a man? Might give her summit to think about besides witches and foolishness. Any rate, I got someone now to read the good book to me of an evening. And if that's the work of the devil, then I say tis a mighty queer thing for the devil to go working against himself. The magistrate had not interrupted this speech. There was a glint of amusement in his eye as he asked, I take it then, Goodman Croft, that you withdraw your charges against this young woman? Yes, he answered loudly. Yes, I'll withdraw the cr charges. Adam Cruff, his wife had found her voice. Have you lost your senses? The girl has bewitched you, too. In the back of the room, someone tittered. A man's laugh rang out. Was it Nat's? All at once, like a clap of thunder, the tension of the room broke into laughter that shook the timbers and rattled the windows. Every man in the room was secretly applauding Adam Cruff's declaration of independence. Even the magistrate's stern lips twisted slightly. There seems to be no evidence of witchcraft, he announced when order had been restored. The girl has admitted her wrong in encouraging a child to willful disobedience. Beyond that, I cannot see that there is any reasonable charge against her. I pronounce that Mistress Catherine Tyler is free and innocent. 
But suddenly, Goodwife Cruff's anger found a new outlet. That man, she shrilled, isn't he the seaman? The one who was banished for setting fire to houses. Thirty lashes they promised him if he showed his face here again. There was renewed uproar. The constable looked to the magistrate for orders. Captain Talcott hesitated, then shrugged his shoulders. Arrest him, he snapped. The Senate still stands. Oh, no, Kit pleaded in alarm. You can't arrest him when he only came back to help me. With a shrewd look at his niece, Matthew Wood interceded for her. "'Tis the truth, Sam,' he observed. "'The lad risked the penalty to see justice done. "'I suggest you remit the sentence.' "'A good suggestion,' agreed the magistrate, "'relieved to have an end to the matter. "'But Nat had slipped out of the room, "'and his half-hearted pursuers reported not a single trace of him. "'They won't find him,' a voice whispered in Kit's ear. A small hand crept into hers. He's got a fast little pinnace hidden on the river bank. He told me to say goodbye to you if he had to hurry away. Prudence. Kit's knees had suddenly turned to water. How? How did it all happen? He came and found me this morning. He said he got worrying about you and came back and sort of spied around till he heard about the meeting. He said I was the only one could save you, and he promised he would stay right here and help as long as we needed him. Oh, I'm so grateful to both of you, Kit's tears started again, and I'm so proud of you. Prudence, will you be all right, do you think? She'll be all right, Goodman Cruff, coming to claim his daughter, had overheard. Time somebody looked after her so's she won't need to run off any more. Next summer she'll go to your school, like I always wanted. Good wife, Croft, the magistrate called back the departing woman. I remind you that the penalty for slander is heavy. A fine of thirty pounds or three hours in the stocks. Mistress Tyler would be within her rights to press her own charges. Oh, no, gasped Kit. Matthew Wood stood beside her. Let us make an end of this, he said. We have no desire to press charges. With your permission, Captain, I shall take Catherine home. 